Hello, right, we're now going to try and um, put two familiar concepts from transfer function descriptions into the state space setting as well. So we're going to look at system poles and zeros, and in particular we're going to try to work out how to find them uh, from a state space representation, or what they correspond to in a state space representation in terms of the matrices A, B, C, and D. So uh, let's just maybe remind ourselves very briefly. Um, so the poles of a transfer function were the values of s where the transfer function um, tended to infinity and the transfer function description of the state space model um, like we saw last time is just given by c s i minus a inverse b plus d. And as you're very familiar with now uh, from analysis of transfer functions, poles kind of govern basic properties like stability. In particular, you need all of your poles to be in the left half plane in order for the system to be stable. So how do, uh, or what do poles correspond to in the state space model? Well, what we're really trying to do is find out um, under what conditions will this transfer function tend to infinity and try and relate that into properties of the matrices A, B, C, and D. And in particular, the, the critical object here is this SI minus A inverse. And as you probably already know, your poles uh, correspond to eigenvalues of A. And we're now just going to try and justify us, uh, that to ourselves um, now. So we, we already talked about this a little bit last time, um, but uh, we, we can compute this inverse with just normal inversion tools. And the way that you generally do that is you uh, SI minus A. You take the matrix that you want to invert. And the first thing uh, you do is divide by the determinant of that matrix. And then you build this big, monstrous uh, adjugate matrix. And the way that you do that is you block off certain rows and you find subdeterminants. And you go through and you just fill this guy out. Um, so this is the, I hope it's called the adjugate matrix. Anyway, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think so anyway. Um, if not, then some similar name to adjugate. Um, but anyway, the point is this whole process just corresponds to finding determinants of submatrices. So we're just doing finding things like this, but with certain um, rows and columns of SI minus A dilated. And so this will just be some matrix of polynomials. And then C is a row vector, B is a column vector. And so what we have is we have um, our row vector and our column vector multiplied by some matrix of polynomials, that's just going to give us another now polynomial, which is what's going to go in the numerator here. Um, and then we've got plus the constant term here. So the critical thing that you see is that after doing all of this, we get some numerator polynomial divided by the determinant of Si minus A. And now we see what we need to see. Um, so in particular, the poles of a transfer function correspond to the values of s where the denominator explodes. And where will this explode? It corresponds to areas where determinant of si minus a is equal to zero. And I'm sure you maybe you used a different, when I was at school, we use lambda for eigenvalues. Uh, so the eigenvalue equation was always looking for values where the determinant of lambda i minus a is equal to zero. But that's exactly what we're doing here. So essentially, the eigenvalues of a correspond to the values where this determinant is equal to zero, which corresponds to where this transfer function explodes, which is what a pole is. So we found that the poles correspond to the eigenvalues of A. There is a little bit of a lie here. Um, maybe you can already spot it. Uh, what's an issue with something I said? I said, okay, the poles correspond to values where the denominator explodes. Well, that's almost true. Um, so, or is there, <laughs> where the denominator is equal to zero, causing this thing to explode. And that's almost true. But what happens if the numerator goes to zero as well? Um, then 
um, well, then you'd be in a bit of a tricky situation. So, I mean, we could easily come up with an example where the numerator was s plus plus one, and the denominator was s plus one. Also, if we followed this, poles uh, correspond to where the denominator is equal to zero logic then we would think there would be a pole at the value s is equal to minus 1. But this transfer function here is just equal to 1. So there, there's a slight catch here. Um, certainly, if a number is not an eigenvalue of the matrix A, it cannot be a pole of the transfer function. But there may be some eigenvalues where you happen to get zeros in the uh, numerator for the same value. And then, well, then you can go and have an argument with someone about whether or not you should call that a pole or not. Um, I don't really, I, I don't think I've actually completely decided for myself whether I think you should um, call such a value a pole or not. Um, certainly in terms of the, the input-output properties of the transfer function, you won't see the effect of that pole, so you could certainly make a case for not calling it a pole. Um, but certainly, if you have, in particular, an unstable uh, pole, so a value of A, um, where which lies in the right half plane, then you would never see it in the input-output map, but you would, for example, see it um, in the response from your initial conditions. So certainly, whether or not you want to say all the poles of the transfer function are equal to the eigenvalues of A, you, you can go and have an argument about that. But certainly, you should be worried about the locations of the eigenvalues of um, A in the same way that you should be worried about the locations of poles. And there's a, a kind of a small technical condition under which all of this will go away. Um, you've probably heard of the notions of um, controllability and observability. And in particular, if A and B are controllable and A and C are observable, then you never get this phenomena where um, you get this cancellation of uh, zeros and poles in the same location. So you could just say, oh, well, let's just deal with observable and controllable systems or, or something like that if you want to get around this issue. Um, but anyway, that's sort of what poles correspond to. Um, so the poles of a transfer function essentially correspond to the eigenvalues of the A matrix in the state space realization. How about the zeros? So um, this one needs a little bit more thought. So a zero, so we've got some input output system y of s is equal to g of s u of s and a, a value s is a zero if for some input if we evaluate things at the value s is equal to that um, zero then g of s is equal to zero so I said zero a lot there but if we say zero is let's say s is equal to z, and this is what we're wondering if this complex number z is a zero or not. The zeros correspond to values g of z equal to zero. And so why do we write it like, why have I written it like this? Well, this is to try and um, sort of get access to certain parts of the state space uh, description in a convenient way. So we put in some input, and we know our output is going to be zero but we, the input shouldn't be zero. So now let's just step through that. So taking the Laplace transform over here, we know that x is equal to si minus a inverse b u. This is sort of the, the standard setup to derive this transfer function here. But let's just change that a little bit, and let's put the si minus a back over here. So nothing's changed, we've just rearranged things. So this is the first part of our state space model. And the second part of our state space model is y is equal to cx plus du. And we can rewrite these equations here in a slightly more convenient way. Um, and what do we get? So if I put 
SI minus A B X U. And now let's start to fill this out. Let's put a zero there. So this, what does this equation here say? It says that SI minus A multiplied by X. Um, Ooh, have I done something wrong? Yes, so this should be um, A minus SI. So, so this equation here now is exactly the same. So here this is SI minus A, X is equal to B, or equivalently zero is equal to A minus SI multiplied by X plus BU. So that's just this first equation written out. This second equation, well, let's just put a C and a D. And so this is what Y is equal to, but we know at a zero, the output is going to be zero for a non-zero input U. So writing down this equation is capturing what it means to be a zero in state space form. The first equation is just the first part of our state space model, and the second part is just saying that the output is zero for the given values of state and input. And what we're doing, what, what we're after is values of s for which we can solve this equation. So after all of that, what we're looking for um, is some vector x u that will solve this equation here. And that should be a non-zero input. Uh, yeah, so this, this vector here should be non-zero. If it was zero, then we'd just be saying, OK, I input nothing into my system and I got nothing out. That's not what a zero is. A zero is when you put in something that's not nothing, but you still get nothing out. Um, and so we're trying to solve this equation. Um, but what happens if, if this matrix is invertible, then the only solution to this system of equations will be x and u equal to zero. So if this matrix is invertible, then the only solution is x and u is equal to zero. So we're really after values of s such that this matrix is not invertible. And um, that is the answer now. So a number, well, a complex number s is a zero if this matrix here is not invertible. And we could write that as the determinant of S. And then let's put an identity in a zero like that. Minus A, B, C, D is equal to zero. So a complex number S is a zero if this equation is satisfied. And you notice it's very similar to our eigenvalue equation. Um, and this is actually called a generalized eigenvalue problem. So in the eigenvalue problem, you have the identity matrix here. In the generalized eigenvalue problem, you have something else here. I mean, this one has got a bit, it's an identity matrix and some zeros. Uh, but in the, in the generalized eigenvalue problem, you just have some other matrix here. Um, and so the zeros of a transfer function are given by solving a generalized eigenvalue problem in terms of a, b, c, and d. Poles, you solve a normal eigenvalue problem. Zeros, you solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. And if you go away to MATLAB or whatever, there'll be some built-in function for solving generalized eigenvalue problems. But there you have um, uh, poles and zeros understood in terms of state space matrices.